um, very much for the kind introduction. Um, yes, I am the Deputy Medical Director. I'm only actually 25 years old. Uh, that's, what, that's what being the Deputy Medical Director does to you. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to come and talk here. I've been to the Royal College of Physicians listening to uh, great presentations over many years, but this is the first time I've actually able to be standing in this position. So I feel I've finally arrived. So that's great. Now, David Rogg tomorrow is going to talk specifically about PML in MS. So my talk, I am not going to focus on the specifics of the diagnosis and treatment of MS. What I'm going to focus on is how we manage the risk of PML in patients treated with natalizumab, which I'll now call Tazabri because it's too long to use the longer word. So um, I'm going to do my disclosures next. My main disclosure is that I am not an academic neurologist. So the faculty is awash with uh, professors, uh, with senior lecturers, and people that devote their life to MS research. I am a clinical neurologist. My academic pretensions disappeared about 20 years ago as I got engrossed in general neurology practice. So that's my main disclosure. Um, above and beyond the fact that the main reason I was asked to give this talk was because Mary realises that the main flaw in my personality is that my life is so chaotic as the Deputy Medical Director that if she asks me something at least a year in advance, I'm bound to say yes. So I got this invitation about nine or ten months ago. Had I received it about two months ago, I think I would have tried to duck out of it. <laughs> so the talk today, I'm going to focus on why we use Tazabri. I'm only briefly going to outline that. That should be familiar to you all. I'm going to talk about how we quantify PML risk to allow informed consent. And you'll hear lots of discussions around the importance of informed consent. I'm going to talk about how and why we monitor for early signs of PML. And I'm going to think a little bit about how we might reduce the PML and extend some of the um, discussion that Gavin had a, a little bit earlier around um, EID. And then finally, and I think probably most importantly, I'm going to dwell a little bit on human factors and the role of human factors in monitoring. So the indications for using Tazabri, as I'm sure many or most of you will be aware, um, is that patients have to have res or rapidly evolving severe MS, as defined by two or more disabling relapses in a year, with one or more gadolinium-enhancing lesions on a brain MRI, as compared to a previous MRI or an increase in lesion load. The caveat that NHS England allows is that if there isn't a comparator scan or if the patient's recently had steroids for a relapse, then obviously it's unlikely you'll see a gadolinium-enhancing lesion. So that's the main caveat, and that's the indication under which we use Tazabri and under which we fill out the Bluetech form as honestly as we reasonably can. So the risk-benefit is well known to you, I'm sure. Um, these are highly active patients, and you can see that there's a fantastic reduction in relapse rate, uh, reduction in progression of disability, uh, a significant number of patients achieved NEDA compared to placebo patients. And I think for those of us who weren't around when Tazabri first came to light, it's hard to just think back and reflect on the fact that at the point that Tazabri arrived, we were using interferons, capaxone, and a little bit of mitoxanthrone. Tazabri was really a total game changer. So we had this fantastic treatment. And it's really interesting just to reflect back now where we are in terms of all the available treatments that we have. But for me, having been a consultant neurologist 17 years, the arrival of this treatment was probably the most exciting thing that happened to me because we moved from treatments that were modestly effective to one that essentially had a, a really high probability of switching people's MS off. And it's just worthwhile just reminding ourselves of that. But of course, in life, you never get anything for free. So... There are risks associated with Tazabri. They're not just around PML, but for the purpose of today, I'm going to focus on PML. So the total risk estimate is around four in 1,000 patients, one in 250. So that's the total risk independent of how we might stratify, and I'm going to spend some time talking about that. So Tazabri has been used widely. So the overall exposure is 202,000 uh, 202, and counting, and a significant number of patients have had uh, treatment beyond 66 months, some even beyond 72 months. And the total patient year exposure is three quarter of a million patient years. So this is a drug we are familiar with. It's a drug where we are very confidently able to define the risks 
And in that way, that does offer some advantages against other more novel treatments that haven't had 750,000 patient years of experience. I'm not going to dwell in any um, detail around what causes PML. You'll all be aware that it's due to a virus called John Cunningham virus. Gavin has already mentioned earlier that there are viral factors necessary for PML. In other words, there need to be mutations in the PML, uh, so in the JC virus, in order to facilitate PML. There are host factors. There may be a genetic component. There may be elements of individual peripheral immune function that make people more vulnerable to PML. When I was a junior doctor, almost all the PML we ever saw was in the context of HIV. You don't see PML in HIV now, given the arrival of um, highly active antiretroviral treatments. And then there are drugs that reduce the CNS immune surveillance. In other words, PML is an opportunistic infection associated with reduced immune surveillance. So how do we quantify the PML risk in order to allow informed consent? So I'm going to run through the main risk factors, how we quantify it, and how we can define in detail what someone's PML risk is. So as of September 2019, these are the latest data I could get. PML incidents, as I said, overall, one in 250. There have been 825 confirmed PML cases. And in th of those, 224 in the US, 515 in the European Union. I don't know where we'll be post-Brexit, but I imagine we might still be in there. And 86 rest of world. So the duration of Tazabri dosing prior to PML ranged from eight right away up to 148 doses, with a mean duration of around 51 months. So the risk factors. You cannot have PML if you've not been exposed to JC virus. So one of the uh, key components defining the risk is the presence or absence of anti-JC virus antibodies. In other words, a binary thing, yes or no. Treatment duration, so especially beyond two years. Beyond two years, all patients should be reinformed about the risk of PML, and I'll talk about how we consent patients. And the third main risk factor is the presence or absence of prior immunosuppressant use. So that was where we were a number of years ago. But in the last decade, we've been able to define things much more clearly by not just measuring the antibody and defining it as positive or negative, but actually measuring the index or titer of the antibody as well. So in Europe, probably around 55% of people would be JC virus serology positive. It depends on both the population and the assay that you use. Some, some assays define it around 50%, some up to, 70, up to 70%. But I think 55% broadly reflects the incidence of JC virus um, seropositivity um, in Europe. So that's the incidence. If you're negative, of course, you can then become positive. And you can become positive in two ways. Either you're just at the border of the assay, and you're just flipping above and below the border of the assay, and so you can flip between positive or negative, or you can have had JC virus exposure and therefore become genuinely JC virus serology positive. So about 10 or 11% a year sero convert from negative to positive per year, depending on which assay that you use. But it goes the other way as well. So about 6% of patients convert from positive to negative with repeat testing. Now, the reason for that is overwhelmingly that they were just above the cutoff for the assay. So the cutoff that's used is 0.4. So with those changing from positive to negative, the majority were low titer positive with a median of only 0.44. So you can see that given the variability of the assay, it's relatively easy to dip in and out of being low titer positive and negative. But the conservative and correct viewpoint is that if you've tested positive at any time, the safe thing is to assume that you are persistently positive. So, for example, if you are high titer positive, there is no need to repeat the test because the assumption is you will remain persistently high titer positive. So, based on the JC serology index, we can now quantify very accurately the risk of PML. So the algorithm goes like this. If your JC antibody status is done, if you're negative, your annual risk of PML is about 1 in 10,000, so extremely low. If your JC virus is positive, 
We then stratify according to whether you are low titer positive, medium titer positive, or high titer positive. I'll ignore this column here because I think the number of patients that have no index value is now so vanishingly small because we all use the relevant test to test JC um, titer. And so if you look at this, you can break it down. You can tell each patient at each time point based on their antibody titer what their risk of PML is. But there's one thing that many patients don't appreciate and that this risk is only for the next 12 months of treatment. And I think many of us tell patients that your PML risk is one in a thousand, and they assume that's their lifetime risk of PML. It isn't. That's the risk of PML in the next 12 months, and that's a really common misunderstanding that people make. And when you actually tell them, no, that's actually your risk for the next 12 months, if you're high titer positive here, and your, your risk here is one in a hundred, you can imagine that's a one in a hundred risk per year. So year by year, you're beginning to stack up risk above and beyond that. So while this is helpful in terms of allowing informed consent, it's really important that we all understand and communicate that actually what this is doing is telling us the risk in the next 12 months. So allied to this, Biogen have done some work looking at how we might define the cumulative risk of PML over time. And I was really keen for Biogen to do this because I think it's actually far more helpful when you're starting someone on treatment to be able to say... If you establish yourself on Tazabri, it's likely that you're going to remain on the treatment, barring um, any particular issue, for a significant period of time. So rather than saying your risk in the next 12 months is this, I think it might be helpful to tell people, well, assuming you stay on treatment for five years, your cumulative risk is this. And if you look at this table and you take out, these are the um, patients with prior immunosuppression, you can see that the cumulative risk remains low up till month 24, and then it begins to creep up over time. And if you break that down in a bit more detail, what you can see now is the cumulative risk according to antibody titer, so low, medium, and high. So, for example, if you are high titer positive, and at at the beginning of your treatment, you're going to stay on treatment for six years, your risk of PML is 28 in 1,000, and that stacks out to about 1 in 35. So actually, I think it's much more helpful to be able to explain to patients not that you have an annual risk of 1 in 100, but on the assumption that you're going to stay on treatment for some considerable time, it's actually closer to 1 in 35. So these data were published in 2017, and they're well worth a look. So what do we do? So we do an annual consent, and we actually document the consent. We send a patient a letter and we state that based on your number of years of treatment, the presence or absence of immunosuppressant, um, prior immunosuppression treatment, and your JC serology titer, your risk of PML in the next 12 months, and we actually document it and we send it to the patient. And I think that's important as part of informed consent. On starting treatment, we also quote the cumulative PML risk over six years. So I will be telling someone at the beginning of treatment not just what their risk is for the next 12 months, but what their risk is cumulatively, assuming they stay on treatment in the longer term. And if the JC titer changes, we immediately reconsent based on the new risk. And that's really, really important as well. The risk isn't stable, it's dynamic. So now I'm going to talk about how and why we monitor for early signs of PML. So the mainstay of monitoring is clearly clinical vigilance and the ability to identify subtle cognitive changes in someone with MS can be challenging at times because many times people come into the clinic and say well I've got a bit of brain fog at the moment or this has happened or that's happened and it can be really difficult in clinic to disentangle what's a new neurological symptom that raises a concern for PML and what's just the natural variability and fluctuation in MS. But we, in our infusion suite, have a discussion at every clinical encounter. So every time the patient comes up from their Tazabri infusion, a checklist is completed. The infusion nurse goes through the checklist to look and understand if there are any troubling or concerning symptoms. And I think that's a really good bit of practice to do that because you effectively have an opportunity to do that monthly or six-weekly, depending on how frequently you're going to give the infusion. Again, the particular things we're concerned about are 
development of speech or language problems, behavioural problems, cognitive change, new onset seizures, or anything involving something going on down one side. So a hemiparesis, in other words, weakness down the left side or right side, or a visual field defect restricted to the left side or right side. These are relatively uncommon in MS and, and raise significant concerns around PML. So I think when we're talking about risk management, the clinical vigilance around PML is probably the most important element. So why do we do MRI monitoring? I think we'd all agree it's a bit of a pain having to remember and having to um, get the patient through the scanner often every three or four months. Our radiologists are not enormously keen um, when we're asking for three monthly MRIs when their department has already run ragged and they're falling over um, because they're so busy. So we have to be able to justify why we're doing this. So this is the main reason. As of June 2015, over 10% of confirmed PML cases were identified on MRI as clinically asymptomatic. So you can pick PML up pre-symptomatically in a significant proportion of patients with regular MR monitoring, and that's the reason why we do it. And so there's a difference between picking, M and picking it up pre-symptomatically and picking it up at the point that it's become symptomatic. So, for example, in the pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic patients, 95% were still alive at follow-up compared to 74% for symptomatic patients. So the survival seems to be better if you pick it up early on MRI. There's usually a shorter time from the suspicion to the diagnosis compared to symptomatic patients. Given that the symptoms take weeks or months to evolve and it takes time for the penny to drop, on an MRI scan it raises the clinical suspicion quickly and often you get to the diagnosis in a more rapid um, manner. The other thing is if you pick it up early, it's often unilobar. In other words, it's not present in multiple lobes of the brain. You can pick it up as a small area of PML in one lobe, and we know that the, pro the prognosis is better if you pick it up early in a unilobar fashion. So 60% in pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic patients compared to only 37% in those that have developed symptoms. And of the 48 patients who'd had asymptomatic PML, after their diagnosis, 34 of them were asymptomatic. So picking up PML early with an MRI scan makes a real meaningful difference to prognosis. And this just evidences this further. So there are two lines along here just to reflect on. So the first are patients that were symptomatic. So their PML was picked up symptomatically. And so this is the point of PML diagnosis. You can see that EDSS creeps up significantly and then plateaus. And these are the asymptomatic ones. Now, note that they started a slightly lower EDSS, but more importantly, the, the um, height of the slope is significantly lower. So the patients who are picked up pre-symptomatically or asymptomatically seem to accumulate less disability than those who are picked up symptomatically. <laughs> So there are a whole number of reasons why we would want to do a monitoring programme to identify PML before it had reached the point of causing symptoms. And that's why we torture our radiologists with requests for such frequent monitoring. So you can see as well that the proportion of patients who've um, had it picked up asymptomatically has gone up over the years. So back in 2009, when we weren't really doing very regular MRI scans, almost no asymptomatic PML was picked up. But you can see over the years, the number of asymptomatic cases has gradually gone up. And so the last data available is 2015. So at this point, upwards of 20% of patients who have confirmed PML, it's picked up pre-symptomatically. And this is entirely due to the MRI monitoring program. So based on what we understand about the PML risk and the antibody titer, a group sat down in 2015 to try and map out an algorithm for how frequently patients should have MRI. And I was fortunate enough to sit on this group. And like many groups, there were lots of discussions, lots of debate, and rather little consensus at the end of it. Um, but this was called a consensus guideline. So I think eventually we did achieve some level of consensus. So just to walk you through this brief, um, briefly, this was in an era where we were stratifying patients according to low or high, and as you now know, we have a medium titer in the middle. But if you were JC negative and persistently JC negative, you'd have an annual MRI scan. And at the other end of the spectrum, if you were JC virus serology positive, 
and high tide to positive, the recommendation was to increase the frequency to three to four monthly. So what do we do? We do an annual MRI for all patients on Tazabri, and I think it's good practice to do a formal MRI scan with a wide MRI protocol so you can get a sense as to what's happening over time. If the patient's JC negative, they have an annual MRI. We decided if you're low titer positive, you have it six monthly. If you're medium titer positive, four monthly. And if you're high titer positive, three monthly. Now, other centres, I imagine, do it completely differently. I'd be interested to know, does anyone's MRI algorithm reflect that, or are yours less brutal for the radiology department than that? What, what, what would people say? Is that broadly what you do? Some, some murmurings there. Does anyone want to comment? Yes? So I'll do pretty much that, but I would say the high titer are more four monthly. Yeah. Months is quite okay. That's really helpful. We're just everybody, we're four monthly as soon as the time. Everyone, yep, Everyone. okay. So it just shows there isn't much science to guide this, but the, the SPC says at least six monthly. So if you're doing it at least six monthly, you're within the guidelines. So how might we reduce the risk of PML? Well, Gavin has already um, <coughs> outlined in broad detail the possibility that extended interval dosing can reduce the PML. And I just want to go over this because I think this is really a game changer in the way that we consider Tazabri. So, as you know, the approved dose of Tazabri is 300 milligrams every four weeks. The initial randomized control studies over a decade now use that algorithm. And the aim was, based on the pharmacokinetics, that if you gave it four weekly of that dose, you would have over 80% saturation of the alpha and integrin receptor. So that's why that dose was chosen. And so we've got a decade or more of clinical practice using that dose regime. And until recently, that's what pretty much everyone was using. People began to wonder whether you could just extend that dose a little bit. And the rationale for that was not really around improving the convenience for the patient, although clearly it does providing a cost benefit, which clearly it does. But the idea was that if you could extend the dosing, could we potentially reduce the PML risk? So this data is from the RESTORE study, which in essence was looking at the consequences of stopping Tazabri over a 24-week period. So at the point that Tazabri stopped, this is the receptor binding, and you can see up to week four, the binding is about 100%. But if you look between week four and eight, you can see the receptor binding is just dropping off a bit. So the idea was maybe that just provides an opportunity for some limited CNS surveillance that might be protective against the risk of PMR. So this area here, where it's just dropping off, but not to a level where the MRI scan is becoming active, seemed possibly to be a sweet spot. Because if you look at the MRI activity, that doesn't begin to creep up to about week eight or beyond. So there does seem to be a period of time here where the saturation is going down, but the MRI scan hasn't begun to kick off. So this is this sweet spot between four and eight weeks again. And you can see again when treatment's interrupted, the binding drops down. The other interesting thing is that the Tazabri-induced lymphocytosis, which we're all familiar with, begins to drop down as well. And one of the explanations for that is, if there's a limited degree of CNS immune surveillance, then some of the lymphocytes are extravating back into the brain, and therefore the Tazabri-induced lymphocytosis is dropping off. So is this telling us that there's a degree of immune surveillance between four and eight weeks that may be of benefit and provide some protection against PMR? So a number of centres began exploring the notion of using Tazabri less frequently. And until a year or so ago, we were really reliant on rather small case series and uncontrolled studies um, that suggested the possibility that if you <coughs> extended the interval beyond four weeks, the risk of PML might be lower. But these were short, small, observational studies. They didn't account for other PML risk factors, 
and really they weren't sufficient to draw any conclusions <coughs> on whether we should move from the approved dosing regime to the extended interval dosing. That all changed when Biogen analysed the US touch registry. So in order to be prescribed to Zabri in the United States, you have to enrol on this register. So it provides a wealth of opportunity to understand how patients get on, look at demographics, look at their JC titer, to begin to understand how you can unpick the risk of PML. So because some centres had begun to use an extended interval dosing, it seemed to provide an opportunity to see whether extended interval dosing in a meaningful way reduced the PML risk. So it's complicated, so you might just have to bear with me here. It took me an hour to try and unpick and understand what these data were showing us. So this isn't a clinical trial. This is real-world data. Clinics are messy. Patients forget to turn up. Doses get missed. Patients accidentally get their dose too quickly, or they wait 10 or 12 weeks. Real-life data is messy. So what they didn't have was a cohort that had meticulously had Tizabri every four weeks and another cohort that had had it every six weeks. So the decision was to break it up. And perhaps the easiest way is to, first of all, look at what's called the tertiary analysis. So these patients in the tertiary analysis essentially had extensive interval, um, monitor, uh, had extensive interval dosing right from the get-go. And by extensive interval dosing, that means less than 10 infusions over the entire treatment duration. And the standard interval dosing was more than 10 infusions. So this is easy. This is a, hypothet a hypothetical um, EID patient. The primary analysis looked at patients that have had less than 15 infusions over the last 18 months, or more than 15. So if you had less than 15, you were extended interval dosing. If you had more than 15, you were standard interval dosing. So this is a hypothetical patient in the primary analysis. So over 18 months, there were less than 15 infusions. And you can see, it started off fairly regularly, and then these infusions, there was a bit of a gap. The secondary analysis is even more complicated because you need, for EID, you have to have an infusion preceded by less than 10 doses in the prior 365 days. So you see here, this infusion was preceded by less than 10 infusions over the last 365 days. And you had to have had that for six months or more. So each of these infusions, these six infusions, were preceded by less than 10 infusions in the last 365 days. I can see some eyes closing, but I've kept, I've, kept, I've kept some of the audience awake, okay? And if you were SID, you'd had more than 10 doses, okay? And of course, it's possible to be in this group and this group at the same time, and not mutually exclusive. This is earth-shattering. Do you know when I said that the onset of Tizabri was one of those seminal moments in my career where we had something new? I really was not expecting to see this. I was sceptical that extended interval dosing was going to make much of a difference. I thought it might marginally reduce the PML uh, risk. But if you look at these data, and Gavin presented them in, in summary earlier, for the tertiary group, there hasn't been a single case of PML, not one case of PML in the extended interval group, compared to this in the um, standard interval group. Now, you can't quote a risk reduction because one group has a zero risk, but you can quote the relative risk reduction in the primary and secondary group. The relative risk reduction for moving from SID to EID was 94% in the primary analysis, 94%, and 88% in the secondary analysis. And these are data not just from the touch paper in 2017, but an update in 2018. So these now include more patients. Now, I don't want to create the impression that using extended interval dosing reduces your PML risk to zero. It doesn't. Ba uh, uh, 2018, there had been 20 cases of PML in patients using extended interval dosing, and here they are. But what you can see, interestingly, for many of these patients, the JC titer wasn't available. So we can't yet say your PML risk of your high titer positive is this if we use EID. It's a real shame because it would be great to have that. But if you look at the ones where they were available, a significant majority were high titer positive. These were certainly patients that were more vulnerable to PML. 
Also, if you look at the patients that had prior immunosuppression, one, two, three, four, five out of 20, and that's a lot more than we would normally see in an MS clinic, patients having prior immunosuppression. And furthermore, many of those patients using the extended interval dosing had gone back to the standard interval dosing before the diagnosis of PML. So this patient, this one, this one, this one, this one, many of them had returned back to SID. So it doesn't completely abate the risk of PML. Of course it doesn't. But actually, the patients that did get PML were very high risk anyway. So the touch analysis has really led to a total change in the way that we're beginning to understand the risk of PML in our patients. And I can't underestimate just what a difference this will make to patients that we're counselling around their PML risk. There are limitations, of course. The index value wasn't captured in touch. It's, not an, off, it's an off-label indication, so I'm glad our pharmacists aren't here, because I'd get shot. <laughs> but most importantly, this doesn't talk about efficacy. This is talking about safety. We cannot yet conclude that extended interval dosing is as efficacious as standard interval dosing. And while our own experience is we've not seen patients swapping from standard interval to extended interval dosing have a flare-up of their MS, we do need a bigger study to actually give us some confidence that we can say to people we think it's as efficacious. And you will all, if you've put patients on extended interval dosing, I'm sure found patients that will swear blind that they get to five and a half weeks and their MS comes back and they'd love to go back to a four-weekly infusion. It's hard to argue with that, although biologically it doesn't seem easily plausible. But in order for us to actually look people in the eye and say we're reducing your PML risk at the same time as we're maintaining efficacy, we clearly need to do a study. And to summarise what we do based on the touch results, after 12 months, we move people from four-weekly <coughs> to six-weekly infusion. We do it for all patients. Now, touch was only JC serology positive patients, so you could argue, well, why don't you just keep the negative patients on four-weekly? Well, as I've explained, about 11% of people seroconvert per year, and while there is not... <coughs> A, a, while there is a low risk of PML if you're JC negative, that risk isn't zero. So I think personally that we should be transitioning everyone onto EID rather than just the JC positive patients. We now transition all established patients on four weekly infusions to six weekly. And we've reduced the MRI monitoring frequency from three monthly for the high titer patients to six monthly for all of them. Now we do that six months after the transition because, of course, the risk of moving from SID to EID doesn't, is, is not instantaneous. That risk is going to take a bit of time to accrue. So we're continuing to monitor at the original frequency until six months downstream, much in the same way as if you stopped a Zabri or transitioned onto something else, you need to continue the same monitoring for six months, given the risk of um, downstream PML. We consent... And actually, it's made consent much more difficult because we could put in the consent letter your PML risk based on A, B, and C is X. What we can't do now is re-quantify the risk. All we can say is that the available evidence suggests that although this is your risk at four weeks, your risk at six months is probably 90% or thereabouts lower. So it's much more difficult to actually sit someone down and explain what their PML risk is until we have broader data from touch that actually gives us the ability to look at it and stratify according to your JC serology. So we state that available evidence suggests no loss of efficacy, but there's a trial that I'll just mention towards the end that's going to report in 2021, and we transition all patients due to the possibility of seroconversion. Now, those who have seen many patients on Tazrabi will realise that one of the commonest reasons for discontinuation is concern about the PLMR risk. So I think it's quite likely that, based on the extended interval dosing, patients may feel more comfortable staying on this treatment in the longer term than they would have done with the standard interval dosing. So I think this is particularly pertinent. So NOVA. Touch tells us about risk. It doesn't tell us about efficacy. So the aim of this study, is anyone recruiting into NOVA? Either that means you're all asleep which is possible, or you're not recruiting. So no one's recruiting into NOVA. So the idea is 
to establish patients on Tazabri. And we don't want to start them on Tazabri every six weeks because there's some evidence that actually you want to get good control of their MS first of all. So you want to establish control with a four-weekly regime, at which point the PML risk is low, and then the patients in this study are randomised to either continuing it four-weekly or transitioning it on to six-weekly. So that's the idea of the NOVA study. It's based on a clinical assessment rather than safety data. So this study is not going to be able to report out on safety. The numbers are too small. The main primary endpoint is MRI. So the aim is to see whether there's a difference in MRI activity in the patients six-weekly compared to four-weekly. And there are another, a, a number of secondary and tertiary endpoints. And this one's interesting because there's some evidence that um, body weight plays into the pharmacokinetics of Tazabri such that if you have a higher BMI, your risk of receptor desaturation goes down more quickly. So it's important for this study to understand whether extending people out to six weeks is more of a risk in terms of efficacy in someone with a high BMI compared to a low BMI. And that's why that's in there. Lastly, human factors. That's all interesting. I think it is interesting. But actually, when we're talking about managing PML risk, far and away, the most important thing is having the structures in place to be able to have a robust governance process around our monitoring. So I think this is far more important than understanding exactly what the PML risk is and being able to quote chapter and verse on PML risk related to index. The mistakes we make and the vulnerabilities we create in our system are due to human factors. So, I think the most important aspect of managing the risk of PML is getting the basics right. And this is hard. If we think about the system of monitoring, we're ordering tests, JC, serology, MRI. We then have to ensure that the tests have been performed. We have to have a system for identifying missed or delayed tests. We can't just rely on the test coming back. The results have to be received and reviewed. Any required actions have to be performed, documented and communicated, and there needs to be exemplary communication between members of a multidisciplinary team and with the patient. These are some of our own examples where things went wrong. I'm pretty sure we're not the only centre that's had issues like this. MRI not performed, patient cancelled. MRI cancelled the scan, but the patient didn't inform us, radiology didn't inform us that the scan hadn't been performed. A gap of six months in someone who was high titer positive didn't have the MRI, and we weren't cited on the fact that the MRI didn't happen. Patients with the same surname, JC serology results were associated with the wrong patient. A patient cancelled follow-up, the team weren't informed, so the patient went up to six or nine months before having a clinical review, the infusion suite were just carrying on giving the patient the tazabri, and we weren't cited on that. And our most recent one is um, we had someone who stayed on tazabri during pregnancy. We worked incredibly hard to give the last cycle of tazabri at week 34. We achieved that. The patient then had a um, delayed delivery. It was a complicated delivery. And despite our best efforts, we weren't able to get the next infusion of tazabri. It got worse because the patient then had their interval MRI scan that showed new lesions or new activity that raised a concern for PML. So we phoned, or tried to phone the patient. We contacted the infusion suite. Communication broke down. It wasn't properly entered on our electronic system. And the consequence of that was the patient came in and had their infusion the next day. Mercifully, the patient was JC serology negative. But we had to do a lumbar puncture on the patient, and it caused a considerable amount of concern, both for me, who was on holiday at the time, Mary and the rest of the team. These are examples of human factor issues. So it's really interesting to understand the role of human factors associated with monitoring er errors. And this list is called the Dirty Dozen by those who understand human factors. And it came out of the airline industry and their um, keenness to look at mitigating the risk of airline accidents. And the risks go like this. Lack of communication between teams and with patients. Well, we've had experience of that. Despite our best efforts, it breaks down. Complacency. 
If you're looking at 500 MRI scans, trying to find one that might show an early feature of PML, it's very, very easy to see how you might miss it because you become complacent. You just assume the scan is going to be okay or the patient's going to be okay. Lack of knowledge. So one of the radio, we had a patient with PML, the radiologist reported it as showing new MS activity. We looked at the report and thought, it's quite unlikely for someone on Tazabri to have new MS activity, and it turned out to be PML. Distraction. When we're looking at results, when we're checking, it's so easy to get distracted. I torture Mary by walking into her office while she's doing something and distracting, and it's a really bad thing to do. If you want to look at results or you want some time to do that, it must be in the absence of distraction. Quite yeah. Lack of teamwork. This is my last slide. <laughs> Fatigue, which I can recognise in the audience. Lack of resources, which we'll all recognise. Lack of assertiveness. In other words, a member of the team thinks that there's something not quite right but isn't assertive enough to highlight it. Stress, lack of awareness or vigilance. And this last one is called normalising. In other words, behaviours develop over time that the team begins to accept, and these are suboptimal or poor behaviours. But because everyone else in the team is doing it, they become accepted. And this is called normalisation. And I think these are the factors that as MS nurses, as MDT coordinators and as neurologists, we need to be far more concerned about and aware of. So I would really urge you to think about human factors and the dirty dozen. So what I hope I've done is given you an overview of risk stratification to allow accurate identification of PML risk, the role of MRI in identifying pre-symptomatic PML, the importance of clinical vigilance, evidence on the safety benefits of extended interval dosing, our own practice around EID, the NOVA trial and the role of human factors. Thank you.